Well, I would like to say that uh, I'm deeply honored uh, to be chosen um, to participate in the Trailblazers uh, concert, but uh, as y'all can see that I'm on fi film right now because I have some medical problems and I'm not able to attend, but uh, I'd like to say that I'm deeply honored that I was considered and I'm sorry that I can't be there to perform and meet all of you wonderful people. And uh, I guess this comes at a, a wonderful time of year during the month of February, uh, which is Black History Month. And as uh, many of you know, that um, uh, black America has contributed so much um, to American culture. Um, and if you take, for me, for instance, that I play the blues, and I've traveled all over the world, and uh, I've traveled to places where you wouldn't imagine that the blues has been, been influential. So I guess that speaks to uh, some phases of contribution that black America has contributed uh, to American culture, and I'm proud to be a part of that culture. And uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, for considering me uh, for this award. I'm sorry that I can't be there, but I know y'all gonna have a wonderful time. And thank you. Some of that. Um, uh -huh. I know you played some in Africa. Can you talk I, a little bit uh, about that? A absolutely. Uh, I guess I've traveled just about all of the world. I think some of the places I haven't been is the North Pole and the South Pole. But no reason to go go there. <laughs> I had no no desire to go to North or South Pole. But um, uh, yes, I traveled to Africa, and uh, it was uh, really a wonderful experience, uh, sort of like to go to the motherland and to see uh, and to interact with some of the musicians there and see the correlation between the type of music that we play here in America and the music that they play in Africa and to see the correlation between their music and our music that we play here. And there's, there's no doubt that there's a connection between what we do and what they do in a musical context. And uh, that was what so was amazing to me that, uh, at, you know, of course, I, I was aware of the history uh, of the blues coming from Africa with the slaves and what have you, but to see it firsthand, that was such a wonderful experience. With some of the African instruments, like the Kora yeah. and the Nagoni, were not yeah. that different from the style that you play with the Piedmont Right, blues. right, right. And uh, that, that was kind of really noteworthy when I saw the uh, African choral players and uh, the techniques that they were using on the choral. Uh, as you well know, the choral is an instrument that they play with both hands and the technique that they use is like with their with their fingers and and thumb. Uh, it's very similar to the technique that I play on the guitar, but I'm, I'm using it with one hand, like the alternating thumb and finger, but because of the instrument and the shape with the neck on it like that, I have to fret it with this hand. But the technique on this hand is exactly what the core players are doing, and that was really, really noteworthy. And I could see it right, right then and there, oh yeah, I know where this came from. <laughs> right. yeah. Were there any other countries, uh, instruments you saw, or musicians that you saw that you thought bore a resemblance to well, some of the music that you play? Absolutely. Uh, when we was in Mali, uh, we, we interacted with uh, some African tribe called the Dongonzoni um, uh, uh, musicians, and some of their, uh, they, they brought primitive uh, instruments, and like we take our, our bass, like you take this bass, stand-up bass or uh, like a bass fiddle they came in there with uh, with with instruments that like uh, that was one string two strings uh, on like branches that they had chopped off trees like and they actually played those those they played those instruments like us 
and uh, it was noteworthy because one of the Don Gonzoni instruments, it was very similar to the bass that, that he was playing like a background with the bass while wow. they were playing, like, and uh, that, that was really noteworthy. <laughs> Yeah. Now to kind of go to the other end of the uh -huh. of your of your experiences, um, uh -huh. when you first started playing, were you did you grow up right in this area right where we are now? Well, here in, here and in D.C. and in D.C. Yeah, my my home, uh, my family's home place is about uh, oh about six or eight miles uh, over in that direction there in, in Milford, uh, Virginia, uh, and that's where most of my family uh, well they was there as slaves and uh, they migrated from here to Washington DC. Well they traveled all over the East Coast, you know, but uh, the beginnings of my family, uh, they was they were slaves uh, over in Milford, not far from mm. here. So uh, you know, I was born in Washington DC, but always had my roots here in Caroline County. And uh, when I was able uh, when I grew up to be a, an adult, uh, you know, I was always fascinated and enchanted with being out in the country, not really like in the city, you know. Uh, when I decided to build my home, I bought me a place here, and I built my home out here in the country. And this is where I've been ever since. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In those early years, your influences, I know you've spoken of your mother as an influence on your playing, and a few yeah. other players from yeah. this, this area. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I had an aunt. Uh, my grandfather, he played guitar. Uh, I had an aunt that played the guitar that used to show me a lot. Uh, when I was just a youngster. Uh, and when I started playing at some of the house parties uh, in this area here, uh, I had a cousin, and his name was David, David Telefaro. And uh, he was really instrumental in showing me and helping me to perfect the alternating thumb and finger picking technique. Because uh, we used to play at the, at the house parties, and uh, David would play like the leaves part but the ordinary thumb and finger and I would always play uh, like a rhythm for, for David and uh, 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 as we kind of interacted with each other and sort of hung out with each other he would show me about how to do the alternating thumb and finger picking and uh, at first that was kind of hard for me but I just kept on practicing, and practicing, and practicing and then the next thing I know, I was doing the alternating thumb and finger picking. Yeah, but uh, he was he was instrumental in helping me to perfect that. Had a lot of other um, relatives that, well, in in a community, say like this back in those days, uh, you know, uh, like weekends and time for celebration. Uh, most of the people lived in a community. Most of all the black people lived in a sort of community like. You know, and on weekends and holidays and time for celebration, they would all come and they would bring their instruments and they would have house parties and uh, they kind of interacted with each other musically and uh, socially and what have you. And uh, uh, I guess that's where um, a lot of this blues and uh, American blues music was born. It was actually having its roots in Africa, but it was born in black communities, just like around here. That's where I cut my teeth. As I, as I grew up, I started playing house parties with my cousin David, you know, and then I perfected my skill. No formal training, nothing like that. Almost all the musicians I knew that came from this area had no formal training. Everybody's trial and error, and maybe some guy to show you something here, somebody to show you something there, you know, and you, you learn, you practice, and you pick up things as you go along. And uh, 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 as you well can see, that a lot of the uh, traditional musicians, uh, once that they recognized that this was actually true, a, a true art form in, in America, they started getting jobs, not only in America, but all around the world. And they started inspiring uh, people from around the world. Like uh, you asked me earlier, and I mentioned that we traveled some places around the world. Like I traveled to Japan. I had students in Japan that I taught that came when I was there to come to learn how to play my music. In the Soviet Union, I traveled to the Soviet Union, Central America, South America, all through the Caribbean. Uh, of course, the Caribbean people, they were more famous, I guess, for percussion like that. But they were still 
having a lot of uh, musicians that perfected the skill, the ordinating thumb and finger picking, and um, a stringed instrument coming from the Caribbean, you know. So I met a lot of guys in the Caribbean that were really um, uh, accomplished musicians. Also in Africa, when I was in Africa, especially when I was in Rhodesia and uh, there's over in the western parts of Africa, like that, I had a wonderful experience that uh, they had they had uh, African bands there, and they played all of the American American instruments. They played the guitars, the trumpets, the saxophone, and, and what have you, you know. So you know, it's kind of universal. You know, it it happens uh, all around the world. But in this community here, uh, we had a lot of uh, when I was growing up, uh, aspiring musicians. A lot of guys could play, but they never reached prominence or was recognized on a uh, national basis or whatever, but they was good musicians, you know, and that's how I grew up. <laughs> now, yeah. I've seen you play many times, John, and uh -huh. I, one thing that always impressed me is you, you're a great guitar player, but you yeah. also have a wonderful voice. You, uh -huh. not, I know you sang some gospel music also in your in your earlier days, and yeah. what's, what's to you the connection between gospel music and, and blues singing? Okay. okay, that's a very good, very good question. Okay, musically, there's no difference between the blues and the gospel uh, uh, presentation. Um, the only difference is the context, the uh, lyrics that express in the different styles of music. Where in the religious side of the music, you're talking about, uh, say, some uh, heavenly experience or some hope for uh, some hope for a life hereafter or what have you you know and spiritual things is expressed in, in the religious side but as musically it is absolutely the same as the blues whereas the blues talks about everyday occurrences it talk about love hate I want to shoot my baby today because she done me wrong or I had a good time when I went to such and such a place or life was hard when I went to work. They talk about every everything that affects one's daily life. Not spiritual things, but literal things that happen to you in your life. So that's basically the difference between religion. They both go hand in hand. Musically, they're the same. Um, lyrically, they talk about two different um, uh, things that happen in your life, right? Mm -hmm. I I know that early. You, didn't you play with uh, Big Chief Ellis? Absolutely. And uh, tell mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about those early days when you first started to get out and play playing concerts and things. Well, uh, uh, I guess Big Chief Ellis was the first. Cause I had heard about Big Chief Ellis. Cause he played with Sonny Terry and Brandon McGee up in New York City, and uh, he actually played with Muddy Waters. Uh, um, uh, uh, several occasions, you know, uh, he traveled. Well, he, he was in New York City mostly, and he moved to Washington, D.C., and I think he was like the first real prominent uh, blues music, recognized blues musician that I had ever met. And at the time when I met him, um, I had not achieved no real prominence uh, in the traditional field of blues, and but uh, I used to play, like I said, play a lot of house parties, and uh, I used to travel up and down the East Coast and travel different places, you know. And I was recognized as a really a good blues musician, but I had never reached uh, real prominence um, uh, in the field of, of traditional blues. And when I met Big Chief. Big Chief had been on the circuit, on the um, festival circuit, where he'd been playing uh, all over the, all over the place uh, at blues festival, and and what have you, you know, uh, uh, occasions where there were huge audiences and what have you like that. So I met Chief, and I met him at a house party, and at the time when I met him, uh, I had uh, kind of gave up. On, on playing the guitar. Like, uh, for about five years, I stopped playing the guitar. Uh, 
if you can imagine that playing house parties, drinking, staying up all night long, and all of the downside of being, <laughs> being a musician, that'll kind of wear you out, you understand? <laughs> so I had quit for about five years. I wouldn't even pick up a guitar. I had resigned myself to saying to myself that I'd rather take care of myself um, physically rather than expending my life uh, out here uh, drinking and well, a lot of them was doing drugs and all that stuff like that, you know. So I had resigned myself and said that I want a, I want a better life, you know. So I stopped playing for about five years until I went to this house party. And uh, the lady that had the house party, she was a good friend of Big Chief. And she told me, she said, John, see, I want you to meet a good friend of mine. Say, this is Big Chief Ellis. He's a piano player. And I thought to myself, I thought I heard that name before. I heard of Big Chief Ellis, you know. So we started to talking. So she said, she said, John, so you play guitar? She said, where's your guitar? I said, oh, I ain't got no guitar. I said, well, I might got one at home, you know. She said, why don't you go home and get your guitar? She said, there's a piano down in the basement. I said, maybe you and Chief can hook up and play a little guitar and piano, you know, play a little blues, you know. So Big Chief said, yeah, man. So he said, I hear you can play the guitar. He said, why don't you go home and get that guitar, come on back here, and we're going to play a little blues, you know. And uh, I was all enthusiastic when he said that, you know. Uh, we went downstairs in the basement, and he started playing them, them barrel house blues, boy. I said, I'm going home and get my guitar, because I want to have a little bit of this, too. Boy. I went home and got my guitar and came back and started playing with Big Chief. And when the sun came up the next morning, when the sun came up the next morning, me and Big Chief were still down in that basement playing in blue. <laughs> they playing in blue. So then he uh, he told me, he said, why don't you, he said, man, say, say, man, say, you really good on that guitar. Say, why don't you come on, go with me? She said, I've been on it, uh, uh, I've been on it, a uh, festival circuit. And he was telling me all the places where he had played and one thing and other like that. He said, man, I want you to come on with me. He said, come on and say, I want you to play with me. And uh, I started going over to his house, and me and him practiced like that. Then we started doing gigs, gigs together. And uh, he formed a group called the Barrel House Rockers, and then we traveled around uh, together playing until Big Chief died. After Big Chief died, uh, then me and Phil went on, went on our own. Yeah. I was going to ask you, is... Uh, now, Phil was also part of that group with Big Chief, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Right. Phil was a part of James Bellamy, uh, Big Chief, Phil, and myself. We was a barrel house rappers, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it's, I was, it's always amazed me how well you and Phil, your, your sounds fit together. And uh -huh. So talk a little bit about, about Phil and his playing and has, how it's evolved over the years and fit into the, the music that you do. <laughs> well, uh... When I first met, met Phil, we was playing at, uh, at a uh, festival down on the mall, one of some of the first American folk life festivals that used to be down there in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, they used to have the big festival. This was some of the very beginnings of it. And I was playing with uh, Big Chief Ellis there, and uh, we was playing in the African diaspora uh, with Sweet Honey in the Rock, Big Chief Ellis, uh, Sonny Rhodes, uh, Johnny Shines and some other blues musicians and uh, Phil was playing with Flora Moulton uh, these were separate, act, separate acts and you know how musicians get together after some of the performances and they have jam sessions you know so after some of the performances we'd get in a jam session Sunny Rose with Johnny Shines and uh, all of us would get in jam sessions and start to start to play and Phil joined in, and he was playing, he was just a young guy with an African bush about this big on his head. And uh, Phil would join in like that. And he was playing all of this dynamic harmonica. I mean, he was he was really making himself heard. And boy, me and Chief said, Dad, man, said, listen to that young boy play that, play that harmonica. So Phil, uh, uh, me and the Chief uh, conspired and said, Say, look, why don't we come get him, come play with us sometime, like that. 
So we did. We asked Phil, say, will you come play with us sometime? So Phil said, yeah, I'll come play with you, play with y'all sometime. And that's how the Barrel House Rockers, how the Barrel House Rockers started, you know. And when Phil, uh, when he first started, he wasn't that good. I mean, he was good. He was really good, uh, more so than a lot of the other young harmonic players. You had um, uh, Charlie Sales and uh, some of them other boys like that. Phil could outplay all of them boys like that, you know. But as in, as time went on, Phil got better, and he got better, and he got better. So after Chief uh, had died, he had a big heart attack. Uh, he went back to Alabama, had a heart attack. And for a while, I went playing solo by myself. I was getting gigs like playing like for $25 a night at, a, at some place, you know, like, you know. So uh, I I played for a while by myself. And I'd do some solo acts like that. So I asked Phil, I said, I said, won't you come on, go with me and, and we play some together. So uh, Phil, he, he agreed. We went to a couple of gigs and really uh, what we played was really sounding good, you know. So it just happened that we started playing more and more, more and more together. Phil got more accustomed to me. I got more accustomed to Phil. And we would work out some of the some of the format for some of our presentation, learn a lot of good new songs and what have, have you like that. And then we got better, and then we got better and got better. But we never reached no prominence at all in this country until uh, I used to work for the National Guard Army. And uh, Tim Lewis, uh, he was one of the guys that used to go around with us to different places, and he was at all of the gigs uh, whenever we had at a blues show or what have you. Tim would always be there, jam session, what have you. Tim Lewis uh, had a contact with a guy that came from Germany, and what he was doing, he was looking for blues men, looking for blues talent, and Tim Lewis told the guy's name was Axel Kustner. He told him about me, and he told him that, oh yeah, I know a guy that can play guitar. And then he, Axel Kustner said, well, how do we find this uh, guy? So Tim Lewis told him where I worked, and uh, I was working at the National Guard Armory. And Tim Lewis, I mean, uh, and Axel Kustner, he came over on my job. And uh, they called me from up at the guard's desk and told me, said, hey, Cephas, so you got a guy here, uh, he wants to talk to you. He said, he come from Germany, but he wants to talk to you. I said, okay. I said, so I went up and got him and brought him down. And he said, he spoke very good English. He said, John, he said, Tim Lewis told me, you play the blues, man. I told him, I said, well, I play a little bit of blues like that. He said, well, he said, I come from Germany, and I'm representing uh, Horace Lippmann, and uh, uh, he is the uh, promoter for the American Folk Blues Festival. And uh, he said, I'm looking for guys that can play. Uh, he said, uh, but I'd like to record some, some of your stuff, you know. So I said, yeah, okay. And so I got my guitar. I had guitar on the job. So I started playing my guitar for him, and one thing that I did a Whole, he recorded everything that I did, and I just got down and started playing a lot of stuff like that, you know. So he said, okay, he said, well, it was good to hear you play, and then he, he left. And uh, about a month later, after he left, the telephone rang in my shop, and the guy said, hello, is this John Seifert? I said, yes, this is John Seifert. He said, this is Horst Lippmann. He said, I'm calling you from Germany. He said, Axel Kusner brought me some of your recording, and I would like for you to come to Germany to play for the American Folk Blues Festival. And I said, oh, my God, me? Yeah, I said, I'll be glad. I said, but listen, I said, you know, I got a partner. 
I say, I got a harmonica play that plays with me. He said, we will bring him too. He said, we want you to come to Germany to play for the American Folk Blues Festival. And I said, I'd be delighted to come <laughs> over there. And that's how that started. So Phil and I, we went to Germany. And uh, th this American Folk Blues Festival, I don't know whether you know, know uh, what that was all about. You well, heard of I, yeah, I know a little bit about it, and I've seen some of those DVDs of the uh, early oh, ones. Almost all of the prominent blues musicians in this country, how they reached the prominence, they went to Germany to perform for the American Folk Blues Festival. A lot of the black musicians couldn't get jobs here. They couldn't get no money here. They couldn't make no money. And what they was doing wasn't considered as really concert stuff, uh, not, not really noteworthy. This was back in, back in the back alley stuff that wasn't nobody interested, or they, they say they weren't interested. You take Muddy Waters, all of them guys that come out of Chicago, Sunland Slim, uh, Hubert Sumlin, Carrie Bell, Lurie Bell, Margie Evans, uh, James Sun Thomas, uh, you take all of them prominent uh, musicians. They all of them went to Germany to perform for the American Folk Blues Festival. John, why, why do you think the Europeans were so interested in your music? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a good question, but the blues is kind of new to them, and it, especially blues and jazz, and it was music that attracted them. Like, when they first started hearing uh, blues music, they heard it from the soldiers from the Second World War. When those black soldiers would go over there, a lot of them could play music, you understand? So they would play all of these blues. And this music being new to them and having such uh, an appeal, an emotional appeal to them, they just caught on to that like right away. Like the, like the blues is a type of music is very emotional, it expresses your emotions, and if you listen to it with, uh, with the musical connotation, how it moves and how it affects your soul, if you sit down and start to listen to blues, I mean, if you ain't got no rhythm, if you don't know pretty soon you be doing like this, or you be doing like this, like that. That's because of the effect of the blues and the emotional, emotional contact it had with your emotions and your feelings. So the people over there, they caught on to that right away. And uh, this was kind of new to them because like you take in England and Germany and, and all of these places, like over there, all only thing they was used to was like march me, oompa, 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 and that was just, that was the foundation for all of their music. But then when you started getting these guys coming over there with all these drawn up phrases and stuff like that, and singing all this emotional stuff like that, boy, they jumped on that, you know. So that's I guess what it was all about. What? The, well, how, did, how did you feel? Because you were used to probably initially playing for t just for your community. Yeah. It must have seemed been a little, seemed a little strange at the beginning. Well, not 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 really, not not really. Uh, uh, you know, we we knew about the guys that did, because there was a whole lot of guys that went over before we did. You know, and. Uh, uh, well, they were, yeah, that's true. Brunzi and some of yeah, those guys yeah, Bill have been Brunzi over there. And yeah. A whole lot of them went over there. Skip James went over there. Bill Brunzi, Sonny Land Slim, all them guys, Muddy Waters and all them guys, they had been going over there, you know. And uh, Delta Rhythm Boys, uh, and they had kind of uh, laid the foundation for other people to come come over there, you know. And we we was part of, like, on the end, back end of that, you know. And so we just joined in with them. And what they would do, they'd put you on tour for like uh, five weeks. You go over there and you stay for five weeks and you would travel all over Europe, all over Scandinavia. And uh, you go uh, Spain, 
and places like that. They will send you all over the places. Sometimes in one night stands, like you play here tonight. Uh, we even went back behind the Iron Curtain. Before the wall came down, we used to go back behind the Iron Curtain and play. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, some of the communist countries, like places like, uh, once you got behind the Iron Curtain, they would send to places like Leipzig, uh, which was uh, East Germany, but this was like communist East Germany. We would go to places like that, you know. Uh, if we go to East Berlin and places like that, all of that was communist. And uh, we used to go over there and we used to go and play for uh, maybe four or five days and what, and travel all all over. I guess I've been in every, every city in Germany, every city in Belgium, uh, Holland, uh, France. Uh, we used to go everywhere. We used to go all of Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and places like that. And uh, I used to, only thing I didn't like about that was going to be in the wintertime. I didn't like that up in the wintertime with icicles on everything like that. I wasn't used to that stuff. Or you can get on an airplane and that much snow is on the wing of that, and you're looking out at that out there. You say, I know this thing ain't going to fly today. That plane would <laughs> go down there and get up in the air and go on, you know. But uh, anyway, so that was kind of, kind of some of the beginnings of me and Phil gaining some promise. Because what they did, they would record you as well. They would, you would do an album. So me and Phil did an album called Original Field Recording, uh, Bowling Green, John Stevens, and Monica, Monica Phil Wiggins. That thing was selling so good over there that uh, when we go into cities and towns and play, they'd sell out. Or they, I don't care what they brought in there, they would sell it out. People were just so enthusiastic about Bowling Green, John Stevens, and Monica mm -hmm. Phil Wiggins. So uh, that was some of the first like recordings that we did and uh, we did them overseas. Now, the Americans are very much aware of what's going on in foreign countries, you know, and they're interested in what is good marketing practices and who's doing good in the market. Now, here in this country, we couldn't even get a, get a recording contract. So, uh, National Council for Traditional Arts was going to put me in field on tour. That's the NCTA up in Silver Spring. Uh, put us on tour for a month. So Joe Wilson called up Flying Fish Records, that was Bruce Kaplan at that time, and told him, said, that we can ready to go on tour and we needed an album. And Bruce said, who? He said, Cephas and Wigan. He said, oh yeah, Cephas and Wigan. Now he know what was selling overseas. He jumped on that. He said, yeah, okay. So he produced our first recording here in this country. And then after that, he started producing all of the other ones that came came after that. You know, then then we got uh, uh, Rounder Records picked us up. We did a record for uh, Rounder. Uh, we did Alligator. Well, we're on Alligator now. That's our, that's our last uh, uh, recording company. Uh, but anyway, uh, we started started really doing good and building up uh, building up our reputation and we started being like the top uh, like the top traditional uh, Piedmont style of blues presentation and that's where it was at the, um, uh, today yeah <laughs> Spe obviously you are a master of the Piedmont style but one mm -hmm. thing I like too about the way you present your music is mm -hmm. You've branched out and learned some different things. I love mm -hmm. the way you interpret Skip James's mm -hmm. tune. Mm -hmm. uh, how how did you come by uh, knowing about Skip James and some of the Delta style blues, and how did you come to bring that into your into okay. your music? Okay, um, uh, blues is blues. Now I listen to all of the different styles of blues, Delta as well as Piedmont. Some of the Delta, I'm not impressed with it. Uh, some of the electric uh, presentation, I'm not impressed with it. But you take the traditional, um, uh, traditional 
uh, Delta Blues, I was really impressed with that. And when I heard Skip James for the first time, I heard him singing in that falsetto and that eerie, like down behind the sun type of presentation. I said, boy, that is the real blues. And I got to learn some of that. And it, and it, the picking was different. It was more of the Delta style, the single string progression, and uh, uh, using the voice and what have you. Still all the blues. So I just incorporate that right into my own presentation. Play the Piedmont, but then I'd give some of that Delta stuff as well, you know. Mm -hmm. As Skip James is, it's, it yeah. is eerie. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And at that time, when I picked that up, there was nobody in the industry that was doing no Skip James. Nobody even knew how to tune his guitar up to get that D minor uh, tuning uh, to play that Skip James stuff. I'm the first guy that did that. And then I started teaching it. I teach it all across the country. And then you had a lot of guys that started playing some of that Skip James repertoire. And I've had guys, uh, I've had guys that that took took off, and and after I taught them, they thought that they knew what they what they was doing, and they get out there and they was doing. Boy, some of the presentations I heard, it was pitiful, and I I felt sorry that I hope I didn't teach that guy that you know, uh, stuff like that you know. But uh, anyway, I'm the first guy that started doing the skip chain repertoire. Uh, I'm the first guy that learned it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. of your contemporaries, mm -hmm. who 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 do you really like? Who who the other traditional blues players who you really think do have that that sound? Well, in the Delta, I like Skip James. He's probably my, my most favorite uh, Delta player. But uh, my main uh, influence was Blind Bull Fuller and uh, Red and Gary Davis. I think they were my uh, my main influences. Uh, I really love. Uh, Blind Bull Fuller, he had such a broad range, but then Reverend Gary Davis, he played in that same uh, ordinary thumb and finger picking st uh, style, but he was really more complex. He was really complex. He, he, he was like uh, uh, really more advanced in his playing uh, than uh, Blind Bull Fuller because he could play other instruments as well. He played, uh, I know he played harmonica, he played banjo, and he could play like uh, John Philip Sousa's dance music, I mean uh, marching music. He could play almost anything. And then some of the stuff that he played on his, on his standard guitar uh, with that presentation, and this was one man playing all that guy, and it sounded like about four or five people was playing, you know. He was really complex. Uh, he was really, he had really perfected his skill. Yeah. Did you have any of 78s of some of these artists when you were yeah, growing up? Uh -huh. Yeah, years ago, I had uh, some 78s of uh, uh, Blind Bull Fuller. Uh, I used to listen, some, some of the people around through the country here used to have some of that stuff, you know. Uh -huh. When they had them all wind up, we, we used to call them Victrollers, you know, we had them, had them 78s. Only thing about the same means you better not drop it, because you you lose it if you drop it. <laughs> yeah. I I enjoyed uh, watching again recently uh, Eleanor Alice's Blues House Party video. Oh yeah, I thought yeah. you guys were really having a good time. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That was a really amazing yeah. group of art artists brought together. Yeah, you yeah. must have had a lot of fun playing with John Jackson. Yeah, and some of oh yeah, guys. yeah, 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 yeah. We we used to have a lot of fun together. Yeah, yeah. That was a good time. That. Uh, when we did that house party thing, it was it was a real house party. We played that had big jars of corn liquor, gallons of corn liquor. Everybody was high, boy. We just cut loose, man. <laughs> John D. Holman and uh, Frizz Holloway came up from North Carolina, and uh, boy, we was we had a good time that time. Floor, uh, floors yeah, on there too. Yeah, floor, floors yeah, floors on there, and Corey cooked all that food and stuff. It was a real house party. And he was filming it all, and we was just having a good time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that's great, John. I really mm -hmm. appreciate you taking the time to yeah. talk to us today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just sorry that uh, that I can't uh, really attend the presentation. I'm really sorry about that. But my medical condition, uh, the doctors won't let me do it. You know. We understand. Believe me, yeah. it's, it's fine. It's I'm, fine. A, I'm on oxygen. Great. Well, that's, I have a question. It's kind of based on what I know of, of your history and what I've heard you say today. To come from you yeah. know a place like this and to be able to travel the world, uh -huh. um, looking back on it, um, what do you think about your your journey? Uh, from Caroline County to, to the world and, and well, what you've been able to see? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think about that as well. You know, I've, I was, I've been really blessed um, to be able to travel the world. I've always been interested, uh, when I was young, I was always interested in traveling and seeing other parts of the world. But I had no idea that uh, I would be fortunate enough to travel to foreign countries and places that I heard about. Uh, I never thought that I would be able to travel to these places. And uh, uh, I just feel very fortunate to be able to have, have done that. You know, I mean, uh, you name it in the world, I think I've been there. And, I didn't have to. Most like uh, one of the uh, one of the real rewards to all of that is that I didn't have to pay for it out of my pocket, uh, and I was fortunate enough to have something that people were willing to bring me to see all of these places because I had something to offer. You know what I'm saying? I had something to offer. If I had nothing to offer, then I would never have been able to do all of these things, you know. So I guess that lends itself to me being proud uh, uh, to be able to play the blues, you know. And uh, there's a deeper, I guess, a deeper uh, reward as well because I'm proud to be a black man, and I'm proud that I have been a part of the contribution that black people has contributed to the world. And I feel very proud about that. See, you got an electric guitar. Now, it's, it's different from what I play. See, I play, like I play all of them strings, like in one, see, like, like, like that. This thing here, for you, is more for a single string progression. Now, let me see a flat pick you got. See what I got here? Okay. This is no good for this. These are good for that one right there. This one is good for this one. Now, what you want to do is, with this thing here is, like, once you learn how to play these major chords, like, like, there's a, there's a F, F major, there's G major, a, B, C, 
see. Now, okay, over top of that, you got a C major, right there. Now, what you want to do with this type of playing is like, when you make a chord like this, inside of that chord right there is what you really want, like to make in your presentation, but playing it with this thing here, not like I play like that. You playing like. Now, all that I played right there was inside of that. That, from the figure of my hand. If I played it up here, it would be the same thing. Now, see, it's, it's like, like I'm playing with that other thing, and I'm playing with all these other things, like a, with this, this is conducive to play with this. Now, inside of these chord, these chord positions like this, is all of them notes that you want. Now, there's a, there, there's a, there was a G chord or, or A chord. There's this uh, C chord right there. Now, it, right inside of that C chord, how you make that C chord is some of them notes that you want to go with the, what you played up there. Uh, this is hard to explain. To, <laughs> I went. I went that there. Now, this was inside of the C chord. That was inside that C chord. Then back to where I started the, the major chord. Now there's the full chord right there. Oh, 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 oh let's see. There's the full chord. Back to the one chord. And, and it's, it's it's all this is conducive with this. Not with what I played on that one right there. And if you can make these chords like this, like you sound like you know the major chords, like so. If I play, let me see. Now, what you need with this, if you're gonna play this one, you need somebody to play like a rhythm part. You know, it's hard for you to play this without no rhythm. So if you're gonna play this, you're gonna play like the single string. Now all of that is inside of them chords that are made like that. Inside of that chord like that. Now, if you play some of that single string stuff like that, I could show you how we're supposed to play this. Like on my guitar, I see I would play like real here. Now, now you be playing. be playing and I'll be playing this be playing this room. Okay. Okay, I would I would have to sit down and mean you play some and I have to show you, yeah. He's been on he's been on Jimi Hendrix boy for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I've been yeah. trying to get him out there a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jimmy Jimmy Hendrix, if you notice when Jimmy Hendrix played, he don't never play by himself. He got a whole band behind him playing. 
that's what he needs behind him. He needs a, he needs some rhythm. He's got somebody to play rhythm. But he his focus should be on him single string stuff like BB King. That's his focus. Focus here. My focus is like playing like bass line. 